In the summer of 2006, Nintendo of America's newly appointed president, Reggie fils took to a stage to help introduce the company's new game console. After their previous system, the GameCube failed to appeal to what would be considered hardcore gamers, the company approached its next step in a completely different direction. This new console would completely change the gaming landscape. In the world's largest games conference, near a room surrounded by the flashiest cutting-edge video games, he cut to the core of gaming's greatest issue. Do you know anyone who's never watched TV? Never seen a movie? Never read a book? Of course not. So let me ask you one more question. Do you know someone, maybe even in your own family, who's never played a video game? I bet you do. How can this be? If we want to consider ourselves a true mass medium, if we want to grow as an industry, this has to change. Despite being around for some 30 years at the time, video games never pushed hard on appealing to a more universal audience than the markets they already catered to. Certain games would take the world by storm, but without a platform intent on tending to the unconventional player, these storms would pass and revert back to being a hobby for predominantly young males. Reggie's speech painted a picture of what the gaming industry lacked. To see loved ones immerse, converse, and communicate in digital worlds, to bond together through interactivity, and give accessibility to those reluctant or unable to play. In short, video games could be for everyone. We've come a long way since 2006, from Nintendo's revolution that was the Wii, to the cheap and accessible marketplace of the App Store, these were catalysts that would expand gaming to everyone. Easy to develop for engines like Unity have made way for independent companies and hobbyists to experiment, and with the success of smaller studios, there have also been more opportunities, stories, and perspectives than ever before in the gaming space. From a creative perspective, video games are in some of the best places they've ever been. However, there are still places that the industry can do better. While most people have now played a video game, the public perception of it has not exactly been that of a medium with limitless possibilities and for all audiences. I still talk with people who think games just aren't for them. However, with the breadth that an interactive media can achieve, I really don't think that's the case. While video games do require more engagement than something like films or TV, it's absurd to discredit their ability to give unique experiences to everyone. I don't think these people are saying this disingenuously, though. I think they just haven't found the right game. So I decided to create a group of recommendations based on the personas of those who aren't really into video games and find the best fit for them. So join me if you will, as I discuss what titles might be best to play for those who don't play. The objective of this list is perhaps to share with friends and family some games that might resonate with them on a deeper level and leave them with a lasting impression. Games that perhaps might help them overcome hurdles either real or imagined. There are a couple of things I factored in when it came to making my choices. The first would be controls. We'll assume that for these cases, the person we're showing the games to hasn't had a lot of time in front of a controller. For that reason, most games that require a lot of technical precision probably won't be good choices. Additionally, I'll not be including the more basic games that can be infinitely played, but are otherwise very straightforward. There's a lot of merit to showing someone simple puzzle games, and Tetris Effect is one of my favorite experiences in recent years. However, I think those are already incredibly approachable on their own, and I want to include experiences that may be slightly meatier for lack of a better word. If a game like Octopath Traveler is a novel, Bejeweled 3 is a short and sweet poem. Both are important, but one is probably more approachable than the other. I'll include multiple examples of games as runners-up, and if you don't agree with my choices and think that others might fit these better, I'd love to see your suggestions in the comments. This video is to better match people with games that they might enjoy, so feedback to that is always appreciated. Now without further ado, let's get on to the games. So let's say you have an afternoon with a friend or family member 
and you want to help them dip their toes into gaming. You don't want to give them something narratively heavy, and you also don't want to overwhelm them with a lot of different gameplay concepts. Perhaps this family member or friend will only humor you for so long, so you want to give them something that's pretty easy and straight to the point. For me, a couple games come to mind. Abzu is an incredibly stunning game about the aquatic world, and its Austin Wintory score helps carry you through absolutely beautiful vistas and seascapes. It's also a pretty simple game to control, with very few points of penalization for swimming incorrectly. For something more rudimentary but surprising, Mike Bithell's Thomas Was Alone is a platformer that is quite unlike what you would normally expect from the genre. It's an excellent case of using something as simple as tiny rectangles and turning them into characters who you'll learn to know and love. My main choice, though, is the short, simple, and sweet game Pilgrims by Amanita Design. Amanita Design has been a long-running indie game company in the Czech Republic, and they've been responsible for some of my favorite point-and-click games such as Machinarium and Samaros 3. While those games have a more complicated nature to their traditional puzzle adventures, Pilgrims was originally released on the Apple Arcade and made to be beaten in under an hour. The main mode of play sees you using cards to see how the characters will interact with others in their environment, which helps give some direction to what types of choices you can make. The best part of it is almost every puzzle has multiple ways of being cleared, so not only is this fun to play, but it's also enjoyable to watch others find different solutions that you might have not thought of. The art style is creative and unique, and feels like a bygone Eastern Europe version of a children's fairy tale. Also, the soundtrack by Thomas Dvorak, while short, fits the atmosphere immaculately, with small changes based on the interactions you make and the places you go. Pilgrims is a perfect encapsulation of what video games can be. A way to complement or extend a player's imagination. Having a hand in the interactions make the jokes funnier the resolution's more satisfying, and creates a tale that you're a part of. So perhaps your new to gaming friend wants to pick up a controller and they're interested in something they can play for multiple sessions. There's a bit of an implication that this person is generally older, but for this persona, let's do our best to also include the other side of the age bracket. Most games, of course, have their own target market, but let's do our best to find a game that would work for as many people as possible. One of the first franchises that came to mind was actually the traditional Sonic games, with most of them requiring only one button and a directional pad to control. Also, Sonic 2 introduced the accommodating Player 2 option of Tails. Although there have been a lot of great options that have come afterwards, the Immortal Player 2 is still a foolproof system that I can still use today to play with a three-year-old family member. When I reached out to others for suggestions, the LEGO games constantly came up as a potential starter. These are also good options as they can be playful toy boxes of the films the person might already enjoy. They're humorous, creative, and even those outside of the traditional TT games still ooze charm with its bricky universality. For me, my choice is a little bit of both, with the Nintendo Wii version of Kirby's Epic Yarn. The game takes place on a 2D plane, so it provides an easy control space with no worry needed about managing camera controls. Movement also remains fresh throughout the game through a multitude of settings and transformations that are found within the levels. It has the simplicity of the TT LEGO games, where your characters take damage, but that damage only depletes optional currency collected. It's a great way of only lightly penalizing the player, while still making it important enough to encourage mastery. The co-op is also really fun here, with a mix of cooperation or competition if you so choose. If either you or your gaming partner run into trouble, you're only a button away from being carried over to them, and it makes for helpful solutions that allow the game to even be more player-friendly. There's also a lot of reasons to replay for completion or collection purposes, with the latter being a venue to get furniture for your very own apartment. Also, did I mention this game's cute as a button? 
The footage really does speak for itself in that it's just one of the most charming games that I've ever played. There's also the music scored by Tomoya Tomita, which keeps the energy always on the right pulse of the cozy or bombastic nature of the levels you encounter. Kirby's Epic Yarn just makes you feel happy. And while it may not appeal to every person under the sun, I'd wager that there are very few others that could be so lovable and understandable for almost any age. Perhaps the person you're showing games to is a bit reluctant to play. Perhaps they might be a little bit more stubborn with their predispositions about games. Perhaps even, the person you're thinking of doesn't actually have the physical ability to play. For whatever that reason is, this category is for them. So long as they're able to sit down next to you and watch you play, here are some games that I think will keep them interested. Taste, of course, has a lot to do with the topic they're interested in. If your person is a sports fan, the Jordan challenges of NBA 2K23 are one step away from being a fully interactive sports documentary. There is also nothing wrong with a good old-fashioned find it, and a good time can be had by all with something like Hidden Folks. The Long Dark sticks out to me since its pretty universal concepts of staying warm and fed can make for some unique watching experiences as you survive the beautiful but deadly Canadian wilds. Sony prides itself in making cinematic games, and The Order 1886 fits that film-like feeling with audio and visual excellence. For me though, instead of 1886, I think I prefer 1899's epic of Red Dead Redemption 2. Playing with your own perception of morality, the game makes your protagonist an outlaw of the dying American frontier. As Arthur Morgan, it's a story about struggling with the quiet discontentment of life and pulling himself out of it. A story of wanting to change, but the messiness and difficulty that entails when it involves people you love. Arthur is the older brother type of his found family. You'll sit by the fire with them, get into drunken hijinks, and run scores with them that make you feel like Robin Hood, until the visage cracks time and time again. It's an emotional pull that follows you throughout the journey, which is sure to resonate with not just the person playing, but the people watching as well. Even if the narrative somehow doesn't impress your person, the landscape certainly will. Even after five years since its release, Red Dead is still one of the most lifelike video games one can find, and it's sure to make a ride through the massive map a treat to the eyes. The game moves at a slower pace, but it's a title about sitting and smelling the flowers, going fishing and riding out into the world to prove that Arthur Morgan can be a good man. Or you could say to heck with all that and go on a bender of buffoonery. Red Dead Redemption 2 is simply a beautiful game. Or to quote Jack Black, that's not a game at all, that's like f Shakespeare. Whichever way you play it, riding shotgun with Red Dead 2 is certainly a great way of not only displaying what modern games look like, but what freedoms and stories they can tackle. So let's say you want to play something that works well specifically together with the person of your choice. A cooperative experience is perhaps a great way of spending quality time with this person, and the social element of this might also make them more keen to spend time on the game because it's being spent with you. Let's also find something that is preferably split-screen so that multiplayer couch co-op is easily accessible. On the lighter side of recommendations, classics like Overcooked come to mind. Its straightforward controls and humorous situation lead for a lot of good communication and cooperation opportunities. It also allows up to four players as well, so this is definitely a great party game. I might be a little tiny smidgen bias, but Untitled Goose Game is one of my favorite titles ever, and its post-launch release of co-op makes being an agent of chaos so, so enjoyable. I think, though, the best long-term cooperative game is Eric Barone's modern classic, Stardew Valley.
I don't think I would recommend Stardew to someone who's just getting into games on their own. It has a lot of front-loaded mechanics, which is great for the freedom of getting into the venture, but it can be a bit overloading to a new player. A second player can not only help with this by teaching the controls and systems, but two pairs of hands on the farm are always better than one. Personally, it's a game my wife and I see ourselves coming back to almost every year, setting up a farm and making plans every day to who's doing what chores. I like working on crops where she likes tending to animals. Also, if one of you is absent for a play session, you can either make your own solo farm or chip away at the work on your estate. Pretty much every action will help your farm get better. It's also a game with a bevy of activities that you and your person get involved in. If you want to just do fishing, fish away. If social interactions are your thing, there's a fantastic cast to get to know and love. Even if your gaming partner needs a bit of action, there's a fully functional cave exploration roguelike. It's an oxymoronic mix of peaceful busyness, with dozens of hours of playtime and perfect opportunities to enjoy with others for almost any occasion and continual occasion to come. And all the better, it's pretty much on every platform under the sun, even the PlayStation Vita. Gone, but not forgotten, old friend. One of the best opportunities that gaming has given over the past 20 years is the ability to give a player an open and vast area to play around in. To sell a player on a perception of freedom to do what they wish. This category is for those who may not have a particular preference, but are broadly curious to what games can do to make them so interesting. There are some incredible virtual sandboxes, and I'll certainly be missing a few in my subjective quest to find the best match. The difficulty is to find a game that somehow makes you feel like you can do anything, while also not spooking the person with a boatload of unfamiliar concepts. Minecraft is perhaps the biggest and most boundless world in terms of opportunities, but I don't know if it's a great starter. It still has a lot that needs to be taught when playing it, especially in the survival mode. The crafting options, while improved upon on console and across the years, are still not very user-friendly to those unfamiliar with games. Add to this the fact that they might be using dual analog controls, and it's certainly a game that you might want to show them later, but just not first. There is also Breath of the Wild, which, although has dual analog controls, does have the benefit of Zed targeting and the ability to readjust your camera. I did recently have a non-gamer co-worker try this game, however, and they struggled a bit with the direction and finding objectives a bit too obscure for them. So while I'd like to recommend it, I can imagine others might have this problem as well. Maybe you just want to zone in on one concept in your sandbox like driving. If you want to explore the world on the open road, the Crew is not only a great racing game, but gives you the ability to have a road trip across the United States of America. Ah, jeez. Sometimes, however, your world doesn't need to be large to be a memorable sandbox. And that's why Animal Crossing New Horizons is my game of choice here. Crossing is simple and straightforward, but it's far from light on content. It's a game about expression, from decorating beautiful houses to finding or making outfits of your dreams. It's a game chock full of chores, but those chores are something that are enjoyable, from cultivating your island to terraforming and collecting. All this on top of a blissful dream of a mortgaged house with no interest. It's just a lovely place to reside and abide in, and that further complements the social aspect of this game. Animal villagers have a bit more toned down attitude than previous AC iterations, but this cast is still unique, memorable, and each one has their own little hobbies and interests. If NPC animal friends are less your person's speed, there's also the social element of visiting islands of others. Even with the limited nature of what can be done, 
The simple act of running around, fishing, and bug catching is still a satisfying activity to romp around in with your friends. To this point, it's no surprise that this was one of the main adopted social spaces during the pandemic. It's a game that invites you to make yourself at home and provides as much expression and opportunity as it can. Whether it's your choice to make a pretty garden utopia, a money-generating fruit farm, or something likely in between, it keeps enough goals open for the intrinsic and extrinsic motivations of the player. Is Animal Crossing the most endless sandbox? Far from it. But it's certainly one of the most approachable and friendly. And there's plenty of world out there to explore, both on your own island and beyond the horizon. One of the most engaging methods of experiencing a game is getting into its story. While story is certainly not necessary for every game, the medium through interactivity can help by making that story more personal. In this way, the tales told in video games give a unique flavor that's hard to find anywhere else, and sharing these experiences may help your person understand why games are worth their time. If your person can get used to the controls, an instant classic in the story department could easily go to Naughty Dog's original The Last of Us, not only telling an interesting narrative through cinematics, but also through gameplay choices. For example, the first time you shoot a gun in the game is tutorialized by ending the suffering of a dying man. You could also consider a story like To the Moon, probably one of the best romances ever written for a video game and with a very high chance of making you cry. It was a tough call coming up with what was best, but for me it came down to two options. Bury Me My Love and Firewatch. I enjoyed both a lot in replaying them, but despite making this list, this is not about how I feel. So to see if these games were right and to break the arbitrary tiebreaker, I brought forth these to the consideration of the Mom Test My mom is not one who plays many video games, so when stuck between the two prime options, I had her play both and tell me what she thought. In Bury Me My Love, you help your refugee wife, Noor, flee to Europe and advise her with what to do through text messages for pivotal choices. It has a simple mobile interface, and it's easy to understand, so for that reason it's naturally best played on a phone. The premise is also really strong, with you doing your best to make the right decision for Noor, as well as listening to her perspectives on the situations. It kept me really on the edge of my seat when replaying for footage, so when I purchased the game for my mom, I thought this would be a great idea. Something I didn't consider though, is if you play on mobile, the game will use real time between exchanges. So if Noor is taking a bus and says she'll message you back when she arrives at the destination, it will actually take that time until she messages you back. I personally think this is a great way of using the medium to make the person you're messaging feel real, and my mom initially thought that this was a real person texting her back, as I didn't give her much context to what she was getting into. This did prove to frustrate her though. She wanted to move on with the story. This real-time element can be turned off, but sadly for my mom, it was a while before she learned this. She was also disappointed as a bulk of the game was just text, making her feel like she was reading a slow, interactive book, which can be entertaining for some, but it's not something she thought she would be signing up for. The game that seemed to do better with the mom test was Firewatch. Firewatch sees you in mostly isolation as the main character, Henry, with a complicated past seeking to exile himself for the woods of Wyoming. For pretty much the entire game, all dialogue takes place on your hand radio, in which you primarily converse with your physically distant manager, Delilah. It's a limited system, but the conversations that you contribute to make for incredible banter about working as park staff, talking about life, and uncovering a secret of Henry's specific location. I won't spoil too much as the story is the main draw, but every conversation feels genuine, and every complication to the mystery adds more intrigue. Other than your supervisor to keep you company, 
it's just you and the wildlife and an absolutely stunning view. Even on the Nintendo Switch, this game looks great. The art direction shines through to make this an area that you'll enjoy hiking through with its lovely cliffs and trees of Shoshone National Forest. Along with just the story, the benefit of Firewatch for beginners is the controls. I've been pretty careful for my main choices not to recommend games that use dual analog controls, as every time I see a new player try this, there is usually an issue with hand-eye coordination. It's certainly a skill that can be learned, but most games with this camera control will usually put the player in situations where good management of controls is needed. Of course, playing on PC controls is probably a bit more natural, but in reality, there are probably a lot more console gamers out there than PC gamers. Firewatch thankfully never puts your hand-eye coordination skills to the test, and motions never have to be done quickly. For that reason, players can take their time with controls with minimal frustration. My mom initially found trouble with the controls, but the story was still memorable enough for her, and she could find her way through because of these controls not being so demanding. At least that's until the motion sickness started to kick in. Due to her not playing a lot of video games, the first person movement was something she really wasn't comfortable with. I had thought about the gameplay hurdles, but I didn't think about how first person gameplay can make some people nauseous. I still wanted to find something that she would enjoy, and I knew that the two runners up were not so much her speed. So I had her try Venba, a story based cooking game about Canadian immigrants. But she didn't really gel with the controls and was confused at how to solve the puzzles. So I was wrong with both of my choices and my auxiliary choice. What now? The mom test had worked in a way, but instead of determining a tiebreaker, it made me wonder what story game would work for a non-gamer. I could have asked her to keep bearing through with it, but sometimes it's good to know when you're pushing a game too hard on someone. I wanted her to play for enjoyment, and if she was just doing it for voluntary obligation, that would be a failure of the experiment. As of this time of writing, I'm seeing how she fares with the lovely French indie game Dordogne, but this process is helping me learn more about not just how my mom enjoys playing, but also not to be disheartened when finding the wrong game. In all the choices I picked out for her, there were still parts she enjoyed, and while none thus far are games she's finished to completion, the purpose of this is to find what the person will like, and above all, that should be the objective of what you recommend. I may not have a game for my mom yet, and I may not have a definitive story choice, but each time I see her trying something, I see a better picture. In 2022, the Entertainment Software Association of Canada released a report surveying a vast range of ages to discuss the habits and motivations of how they play video games. When asked why they play games, a much higher percentage of older adults answered that games are a great way to pass time when bored, unwind, and have fun. It's a lot more homogeneous of a response compared to the 18 to 34 year old demographic. The ESA's 2021 study showed that as the age bracket increased, the preferred games quickly rose to casual games. This is not trying to out certain people as non-gamers. The data in the Canadian study shows that even older gamers still play around an average of an hour a day. It does make me worry though for those who see games as time wasters if they're just playing games to waste their time or if the games made for them are actively trying to waste their time. It's distressing to see this description when that mentality shuts away seeing the opportunity and variety that gaming has as a medium. On the other hand, these reports could do a lot better than lumping together so many interests of players as casual games. Tetris and Mario are very different games, but they're still both labeled under casual. It doesn't really categorize the activity of the player, and even more negatively, cast those who enjoy it as potentially less enthusiastic to video games than a core gamer. 
Perhaps everyone has now played a video game, yes, but are we still in the mentality of 2006? How good are we at recognizing that other people may find games more interesting if only the right ones were more visible to them? Perhaps the solution is just better communication. The term cozy game has become popular in recent years, and while some people may complain how many there seem to be now, it's truly just a genre that has really been there for a while now, but now has a name that people can classify suggestions to. As a more personal approach, the next time you talk to someone who says they may not like games, ask them what they don't like about them. Perhaps through a process of elimination, you can come to know what games would best work with them and avoid the ones with mechanics that might frustrate them. During the time I was writing this, I was talking to a friend about games and he brought up that his girlfriend thought that games were boring, and to her perception, a lot of the games that he was playing were competitive. Her favorite media was romantic Bollywood films, so that told me that she would be interested in stories about people. So I suggested that she check out Vemba, as it's a domestic story of an Indian family. After just even watching the trailer, she was sold on playing the game. Sometimes it just takes the right content for someone to have new eyes for the medium. I hope that some of these recommendations help in finding a game for a person in your life. Perhaps after all is said and done, they may even come to appreciate gaming as something more than they originally thought it to be. If you have a game that you would like to recommend to newcomers, please let me know in the comments. I truly believe that gaming is a hobby that anyone can enjoy in at least some aspect. The only thing they need is the right games to meet their tastes. Perhaps that game doesn't even exist yet, but gaming has come a long way, and I'm optimistic for what the future holds. Hey, thanks for watching this video! If you're looking for videos similar to this topic, YouTube creator Rasputin had his wife play through a series of different games and made observations based upon her reactions as someone who doesn't play video games. Pixel A Day's video on what's missing in games talks a lot about the absence in current game spheres in regards to represented players and genres. She also gave me some great advice on writing the script for this, so a giant thank you goes out to her as well. I'll link these in the description of this video, as they were both inspirational and amazing to watch. Finally, if you like what you see, make sure to subscribe so you know when new uploads are released.